welcome once again on behalf of Hospice of Santa Barbara to our Heroes of Hospice Luncheon. This tradition is fairly new. It started four years ago. So we're in our fourth year. And um, I am happy to be standing in front of you as a, a former recipient of a volunteer award, but mostly standing here because I believe so much in Hospice of Santa Barbara. As we all know, as I'm looking out at the room, there are so many worthy nonprofits here in Santa Barbara, but to me, this Hospice of Santa Barbara is a shining star for me personally. They got me through a very, very dark period um, after my father's passing. And so it's been a pleasure to um, be a spokesperson for Hospice of Santa Barbara. And, uh, and I task all of you also to be ambassadors of this great organization because there's still people that don't know about Hospice of Santa Barbara. So once again, welcome. Hospice of Santa Barbara, if you don't know the mission of Hospice of Santa Barbara, to care for anyone experiencing the impact of life-threatening illness or grieving the death of a loved one, and they couldn't do it without the help of all of you that are sitting here today, you wonderful family of supporters. So thank you on behalf of Hospice of Santa Barbara for being here. So we've got a great program lined up. Our luncheon is going to feature, of course, our presentation of our Heroes of Hospice Awards, honoring our very deserving recipients this year in the category of Partnership Award to Doctors Assisting Seniors at Home, or DASH, as I am just learning more about and I'm so impressed. Also, the Legacy Award to Dana Vandermeer. Dana. And our Volunteer of the Year Awards going to Joe Jowell, Muriel Ross, and Ann Smith Kors. So we also have a very special video coming up this afternoon, which is going to highlight Hospice of Santa Barbara's I Have a Friend Mentor Program. There's a little bit of a surprise. They've had to tape my mouth shut so I don't tell you, but it's coming up later. I promise you'll love it. Um, and just so you know, all of the hospice programs, including the children's programs, are crucial for those in the community, of course, who have suffered the loss of a loved one, and they are all offered free of charge, all the services of hospice. In order to help people find a way to cope through difficult times, Hospice of Santa Barbara focuses on the emotional, the social, the spiritual, and the practical needs of those people in need. And so for also those that are Dealing with terminal diagnosis, the toughest, hospice helps them find the best way to, remain, to make the remainder of their lives meaningful, to find closure, to find hope. I'd like to introduce the chair of the board of directors, Eric Bowers, chair of Hospice of Santa Barbara Board. On behalf of the board of directors, I'd like to welcome all of you to the fourth annual Heroes of Hospice fundraiser. I'd like to recognize some of our local officials who have joined us today. Hillary Blackerby for Assembly Member Doss Williams, Santa Barbara City Council Member Frank Hodgkiss, District Attorney Joyce Dudley, and Santa Barbara County Fire Chief Eric Peterson. Thank you for being here. I'm also thrilled to announce that this year we have our largest attendance for the luncheon. We have more than 240 people here. So thank you very much. We have an extraordinary opportunity today to celebrate some individuals who have been making people feel special for many years, helping HSB be a shining light to those who are struggling through incredibly dark and difficult times in their lives. We call these honorees the Heroes of Hospice. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to our luminary sponsors, Barry and Jill Kitnick, and to all of our other sponsors. Thank you very much.
Please notice all of our supporters in the program today. I would also like to thank our honorary committee who helped make this lunch impossible and to acknowledge the HSB Board of Directors, the HSB Advisory Committee, and the Board Emeritus for their ongoing vision and steadfast support. Thank you very much. And now especially, more so than uh, the Board of Directors especially, to all the HSB staff members and volunteers. Um, we can't do what we do without all of you, so we really do appreciate everything you do every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the CEO of Hospice of Santa Barbara, David Selberg. We go back a long way. David and I met uh, during his days with Pacific Pride, and I recognized that same twinkle in his eyes because it was the same twinkle that Gail Rink had, and said, when I heard that he was taking over this position, I just thought, how perfect is this? And so since he has been at the helm of Hospice of Santa Barbara, he's no longer a newbie anymore. He's outgrown that. But his commitment to our community has helped to improve the lives of thousands of people that have walked through the door of Hospice of Santa Barbara. And under his leadership, Hospice of Santa Barbara has just finished drafting a new strategic plan for the next five years to guide this organization into the future and continue to grow to new heights. It's my honor to introduce David Selberg. Hello, thank you, Catherine, so, so much. This is a wonderful, wonderful crowd. I'm so pleased. Let me first congratulate and give a heartfelt thank you to all of our Heroes of Hospice Award recipients you're about to meet today. Your contributions to our community truly make it a better place for all of us. And thank you to all of you for being here to recognize them as well. Our program today has a very special focus on children and grief, and what we at Hospice of Santa Barbara are doing through our children and family services to address the unique challenges for children as they navigate significant loss and illness of those they love. As all of us know, what and how children experience their childhood is a powerful indicator of the adults they will become. Important words like consistency, positive reinforcement, boundaries, safety, and love are some of the critical components that will likely help form the healthy and happy adults of tomorrow. Sometimes, however, a wrench is thrown into their lives that is beyond anyone's control. The death of a parent sibling or loved one is one such traumatic event which significantly complicates and often defines a childhood. I remember so clearly my own mother's sudden death when I was 10 years old. There was the day before mom died and then the rest of my life the day after. These are defining moments for kids and if not spoken of, approached or looked at in a proactive and even healthy manner, such a death can lead to extreme feelings of confusion, abandonment, guilt, deep, and deep sorrow for a child. These feelings can manifest into depression, various addictions, self-harm, and even suicide. In a recent statewide poll of 1,000 high school juniors and seniors, 90% indicated that they had experienced the death of a loved one. We understand this at Hospice of Santa Barbara. Our success stems from our approach. We look first at each child or circumstance and introduce the therapeutic approach and create the environment that is most suited for that child and situation. 
The ways in which we serve children are many. We provide individual counseling for children and teens, counseling for entire families, support groups for kids, and we are present every week at all local high school campuses throughout greater Santa Barbara. Our counselors have an ongoing presence in Juvenile Hall and Los Prietos Boys Camp, and we have a very special mentor program called I Have a Friend. You'll learn more about this program in just a few minutes. What is important for you to know is that our children's programs, all of our, all of our programs actually, are adapted to suit the specific circumstances of the individual. We tailor every aspect of our services and programs to meet children, teens, and adults where they are at. We provide nearly 700 counseling sessions to kids every year and we host 65 support group meetings annually, walking side by side with every child and serving them for as long as it takes. It is thanks to you that we are able to offer these wonderful programs. Your support makes it possible for Hospice of Santa Barbara to be there for these children and their families during an incredibly difficult time in their lives. So again, thank you so much for being here and enjoy. Thank you, David, and thank you also for sharing your personal story, which I had not known. Um, it is my pleasure to present a video that we know is going to capture the important work that Hospice of Santa Barbara does for children, their families, and leading them on their paths through grief and sorrow after they've lost a loved one. And one of our programs in particular, Hospice of Santa Barbara program, that you've heard referred to, and some of you may know it and some of you may not, it's called I Have a Friend Mentor Program. And it was the brainchild of Gail Rink, who overheard a child say to his mom after the death of the father, will I ever be normal again? And with that, we present the video. In our community, one in five children will experience the death of someone close to them. By the age of 18, one in 20 children will experience the death of one or both parents. Hospice of Santa Barbara's Children and Family Services Program offers no-cost individual and family counseling, support groups, workshops, and community outreach, all designed to address the unique grief of children, provided by professional grief counselors and therapists. Our Children's Counseling Program offers a wide range of age-appropriate activities to help kids cope with grief and loss. Be it the death of a family member, friend, or beloved family pet. Some of the goals of our program include helping children understand that they're not alone, that what they're going through is normal, and that they will eventually be okay again. With the passage of time and the ongoing support of a skilled counselor, their grief begins to lessen and their hearts begin to heal. Counseling can also reduce the likelihood of unresolved grief causing problems later in their lives. Hospice of Santa Barbara also offers a safe and nurturing space in which children who have experienced loss have the opportunity to interact with one another. As participants in our support groups, children and teens develop skills that help them cope and heal. Meaningful dialogue, board games, expressive art, music and literature are some of the many tools we utilize to help children of all ages whose individual personalities and grieving styles differ. It's incredibly heartwarming to see these kids begin to connect with one another as they realize they're not alone in their loss. We can actually see the healing begin. Hospice of Santa Barbara has also become active on local school campuses, providing professional weekly support groups for high school, alternative school, and university students. Our on-campus, year-long support groups provide an atmosphere of trust, which allows for authentic communication and healing through intimate sharing. 
We also work to educate teachers and staff on how best to deal with students' questions about traumatic or violent death, such as a peer suicide or tragic accident. We're able to respond quickly to any and all of the many schools from Carpinteria, Goleta, or even Santa Ynez who call on us when a traumatic death occurs within the campus community. Started in 2002, one unique and successful children's program at Hospice of Santa Barbara is our mentorship program called I Have a Friend. A thoroughly trained and screened adult mentor who experienced the death of a parent or sibling when they were young is matched with a child newly coping with a similar death. The similar experience allows the child and the adult to form a special and unique bond. That adult truly understands the obstacles, challenges, and difficulties of losing a parent, sister, or brother as a child. The benefits can be twofold as the potential mentors often discover and address their own unresolved grief during the training process. Before you go into it, you don't really know who you're going to get matched up to. And so there's probably a little bit of apprehension about that. And I guess it surprised me how unbelievably fantastic our matchup was. I mean, on so many levels. And to me, I, I don't think I was really expecting that and just how much I really look forward to, you know, our times together. In the beginning, I didn't want to do it because I'd been to counseling before and I didn't like it at all. I found it very boring. And then I met Nancy and after we, I think we met a couple times, then I got more into it and I thought, it's really fun. And it, it seemed, it didn't seem like counseling. It sort of seemed like I'd, I was going out with a friend. You said you've got to love yourself. Paloma really, loves, loves Becky. And um, Paloma was very aware that Becky had lost her father when she was young. And I could see from the beginning a very, very strong bond and uh, closeness due to that. Knowing that you have somebody that has gone through that, you just automatically feel connected. And for me, um, it's kind of brought me full circle dealing with my dad's death and for Paloma um, it's allowed her to talk about her dad I think and, and realize or see that life does go on and um, she's not abnormal. As long as you got me and I got you you know I got a lot to go around I'll be your friend your other brother another love to come and comfort you. There was really only like the first two or three outings that we actually talked about the, our, the, the deaths of our dads. But most of the time we just kind of, just kind of talk about just regular stuff. I will always love you. I like Becky because she's nice and she's fun. To be able to give back in a way and touch somebody's life that, and share and really meet somebody and share that common bond and, and form that friendship and relationship is more rewarding than I, I can even express. I mean, it's been the best experience, volunteer experience that I've been involved in. I love you, and that's all I know. She watches Becky and she obviously says, she did it. She's doing it. So obviously, there is hope that I'll be fine. It was just nice to be able to do stuff that wasn't really planned out. Just kind of meet and then uh, just figure something out that would be fun for that day. I immediately knew this was great for Sarah. It was just what she needed. I love her, but I don't understand what it's like to lose a parent. and. And for her to have someone who can, who can truly understand her, I knew would be powerful for Sarah. I love you, and that's all I know. Whether it's I Have a Friend, or any of the other programs and services especially designed for children and teens, Hospice of Santa Barbara addresses the unique and sensitive challenges that children face following the death of a loved one. It's
And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to point out that in that uh, film, which was taken part of it 12 years ago, the mentor-mentee match is back with us today. Sarah Utterman has flown in from Portland, Oregon, where she has now graduated from college, and her mentor is also here, Nancy Simon. Can they please stand and be acknowledged? And beautiful. Sarah's father is also here, Bernard. Bernard. And we'd like to ask Sarah and Nancy to come on up to the stage. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Sarah. And uh, I just want to thank you all for being here and for supporting the Hospice of Santa Barbara as well as the I Have a Friend program. Um, as you can see, it's been quite a long time since that film, uh, since that was filmed. <laughs> I don't have braces. Um, and I can't even begin to, to describe how much the program has helped me. Um, I graduated the program, I don't even know, maybe eight years, six years ago, but uh, 14 years later, I'm still seeing Nancy. I may live in Oregon now, but um, whenever I get in, come into town, it's so nice just to catch up with Nancy over tea or just hanging out and catching up. Um, I first started um, therapy after my mom died in, when I was nine. Um, and like I said in the video, therapy was boring. Um, as you can imagine, for a nine-year-old, um, you don't really want to sit there and talk about your feelings. It's kind of uncomfortable. Um, which is why Joy, the counselor at the time, recommended that I have a friend program. Um, at school, right after my mom passed, I felt very isolated. Um, none of my friends could understand what I was going through. Um, I, you know, I probably isolated myself as well. I didn't know how to act around others, um, which led to me switching schools. And then I had the same question of, will I ever be normal? Um, and you know, that's still kind of a question I have today. I had a very different experience than my peers, and um, it's going to shape the rest of my life, ultimately. But this program helped me see that there are other children, other people my age, adults who went through the same experience. Um, and what was so great about the program was that we would meet with other children and we would just watch movies, um, you know, decorate pumpkins for Halloween, um, make candles for our parents during the holidays. Um, and we never really talked about our parents that we lost, but it was just the understanding that everyone in that room, the adults, the children, had gone through the same experience. Um, Nancy was the perfect match. I can't imagine having been paired up with anyone else. Um, we would do fun things every week. We had our special day Thursday where we'd get coffee, go to movies, go to the beach. Um, she'd help me study for vo vocab. Um, but it was really anything we felt like doing. There was no structure to it. Um, it, it really just was easy. It was just hanging out with a, a girlfriend and, and knowing that she'd gone through the same thing I had. Um, let's see. So the program was originally supposed to be for a year. And as you can see, it's been quite a long time. <laughs> um, but the program also helped me see that I wanted to help other children. So when I was in high school, I chose to volunteer with the younger children in their support group once a week. And um, the same thing as uh, the older kids program, um, they wouldn't really talk about it, but it was nice for me to be there to show them that as a teenager, um, they, can, you know, they can do normal lives, they can you know, go to high school, have friends, be normal, um, that they don't need to feel isolated. Um, you know, it's been quite a few years now, but I can say that I, you know, uh, I'm just grateful for having been introduced to the program. Uh, had I not felt that connection with Nancy, knowing that I would have a normal life one day, I, I, you know, I still question whether or not it's ever going to be normal, and it's not. My experience is so different than anyone else. Um, but I can see now that I can, you know, one day have a family, I can have kids, I can tell them about my mom and share that experience with others. Um, but more importantly, I'm just happy for, the, organi for organ the organization for matching with Nancy. I wouldn't have that connection with anyone else. Um, and I really hope that this program can continue um, for many, 
other children um, so that they can get the support they need. As you uh, saw in the video, I had no idea how to really help Sarah when her mom died. Um, it was very, very difficult for Sarah. Uh, she was in elementary school. Her friends, she had been a very popular girl in elementary school, had lots of friends. And as soon as her mom died, her friends didn't know how to be with her, and they pretty much abandoned her. And she found herself eating alone, lunch alone at school every day. And she would come home crying and not want to go to school. And no one knew how she felt. And I spoke with the principal. I spoke with her teacher. And all they could say is, well, the kids don't know how to be around Sarah now. They just don't understand her. They don't understand what's going on. And she felt all alone until the I Have a Friend program. And she met Nancy, who actually knew exactly how she felt, exactly how she felt. And that was very healing for Sarah. And they had so much fun. And um, Nancy was able to. Um, convey to Sarah that life goes on and one can have a wonderful life in spite of losing a mom at nine years old. And so I am so grateful for this program and um, uh, truly uh, uh, Sarah has been able to grow up as you can see uh, very, uh, as a, she's grown to become a very strong person and it was because of her connection with Nancy who was able to um, just be with her. To be able to be understood when something like that happens to you is huge. And no one could understand. Nobody could understand what that feels like. I couldn't understand. But Nancy knew exactly what that was like. And so I'm just so grateful. Thank you. I just want to add a quick thing that, um, you know, it, it, there's so much benefit you get as a, as a mentor, too. Um, the most, obviously, being this, you know, enduring forever friendship with Sarah and her family. But also, going through the training itself is an amazing thing. 20 years after, or so more maybe, after I'd lost my own mom, being in a group of men and women who had gone through the same thing, I'd never been with that either, and it kind of mirrors their experience. And um, it was really moving, and it's just a fantastic program, and happy to be part of it. So, thank you. So, Nancy. Uh, Nancy and Sarah and uh, Bernard, thank you all for sharing your beautiful story. And that was such a touching video. I've heard for so long about the mentor program, but seeing it firsthand is really remarkable. We are going to begin the portion of our program that so many of you came here today to celebrate our heroes of Hospice of Santa Barbara. And thank you very much again for your generous giving. All right, I love this first one because um, I feel like I know a lot of organizations in Santa Barbara and I didn't know about this one. So um, it's my pleasure. First of all, um, let me ask you a question that probably applies to most of the people in this room. If you have an elderly parent or someone else in your life that is a senior, what kind of security do you think it would give you and them if they had access to doctors and nurses seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., if they had access to doctors and nurses, again, for that time, for $60 a month, $90 if you're a couple. Sounds too good to be true? I thought so. Well, thankfully, it is not in this community. 
offering on-call rapid response medical care throughout Santa Barbara and Goleta is DASH, an acronym for Doctors Assisting Seniors at Home. And they have cut a number of costly emergency room visits and hospitalizations for nearly 2,000 clients significantly and allows them to see in a non-stressful environment a senior in their own home, usually within an hour of calling. Dash's team of nurses and physicians available to respond to houses of seniors from Santa Barbara all the way to Goleta, usually arising, arriving, as we mentioned, within that hour. And they are so incredibly talented. And so it is now my pleasure to ask to come up Dr. Mike Bordowski, Dr. Dennis Baker, and Dr. Eric Troutwine. They will be representing DASH. My name is Eric Troutwine. Let me stand this up a little taller. Dennis Baker actually was unable to join us today, um, but we're still accepting this award on behalf of, of him and the rest of DASH. So thank you guys very much. Thank you, David, and thank you to the board um, of HSB for this award. Uh, we're longtime admirers and collaborators with HSB, and so for us to receive this award from, from this organization really does mean a lot. Uh, some of you may be wondering why I'm the one speaking uh, right now, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm wondering that myself. Um, I, was, uh, I, I was nobody's first choice for this. Uh, <laughs> when we heard about the award, we all agreed that the person who should be doing the speaking is our, our outreach and enrollment coordinator, Jeannie West, who... who many of you probably know, I can guess that from the applause, uh, and who spent hours, countless hours, giving speeches uh, to groups large and small, explaining DASH, helping people get enrolled, and then actually going out to the homes and helping people get signed up for the program. She's a much better speaker than I am, so if you want to take a moment and imagine what might have been. Uh, although I will warn you, she's such a good speaker, looking around the room, there might have been a couple of dozen of you who signed up for DASH by the end of the speech, and so uh, you might count yourself a little bit lucky. Uh, it, thank you for the introduction. I, my remarks, I wanted to just say a little bit about how this program came to be. Um, and so hopefully this doesn't repeat too much. Uh, as, as many of you know, Mike and myself and Dennis and Dr. Michael Carney uh, are a partnership uh, that we call Palliative Care Consultants of Santa Barbara. We've been around for 10 or so years. We provide palliative care services at the hospital, and then we have an affiliation with the Visiting Nurse and Hospice of Santa Barbara where we uh, do home hospice and serenity house care. We do some community palliative care. And this work is very meaningful to us. It's, it's often very difficult, challenging, but rewarding. Um, and it, it, it humbles us in many ways. It humbles us on an individual level because we struggle with getting accurate diagnoses, accurate prognoses, treating symptoms. But it also humbles us because it shows the gaps of our medical system. It shows the people who fall through cracks. Uh, and We've spent a lot of time um, over the last 10 years sort of observing kind of what happens to uh, groups of patients who maybe can sort of fall by the wayside. There's a large group of, of elderly patients, uh, many of whom are, are low income, socially isolated, but not all, uh, who have no other resources when the going gets tough other than to call 911 and be taken to the emergency room. Uh, it's not so much that that's what they want, it's just that that's all that they have access to. Uh, people will tell us, and people would tell us in our internal medicine practices again and again, I didn't want to go to the hospital, I just didn't know who else to call when I was having difficulty breathing, or when I had pain, or when I had a fever. And over the years we thought about different ways of, you know, perhaps addressing this gap. Uh, we meet together a lot as a partnership, 
And one day in, uh, I think, 2011, Mike here uh, came in with the bright idea that we should apply for a grant from the government that he had learned about called the Healthcare Innovation Awards. Uh, this was part of the Affordable Care Act, and there was a call for grants uh, to try to do the very simple task of improving care, improving patient satisfaction, and doing it all for less money than they're currently spending. And so we talked about a program like DASH and figured, well, how hard could this be? <laughs> it turns out it's pretty hard. Um, we, um, first of all, had never written a grant proposal in our lives. Um, but luckily, um, uh, with a little family help, uh, Mike's sister-in-law, who's here, had actually done some grant writing and really came through for us. We were able to get this 80-odd page application together and send it off. Uh, along with 3,000 of our closest friends around the country of different groups who were applying for grants. And we kind of figured it, that would be about it. It would go nowhere. So we were very surprised uh, to find out that we were one of 106 programs in the country that got selected to receive a Medicare grant uh, in 2012. We, uh, our, our surprise turned to shock when we saw the list which, of, of recipients, which was names like Stanford, Harvard, UCLA, Duke, and then us. Uh, Mike, Michael, Dennis, and Eric. Um, we kind of had a rough idea what we wanted to do, but we knew we needed people to make it happen. And so really a large part of what I want to say is, is that we got very lucky. We got very good people to come and work with us. It turns out that it's not easy to hire somebody when you tell them that the job is unknown, uh, that we don't know where you're going to be working, exactly what you're going to be doing, what your hours are going to be. Oh, and we're grant funded, and once the grant ends, it's probably all going to end too. Um, but somehow or another, we were able to get nurses, doctors, administrators. A couple of them are here. Liz Orr, one of our nurses, and Anna Davison are kind of our do-everything administrator. <laughs> And uh, together, we were able to build this program. Uh, in the four years, we've enrolled about 1,800 seniors. Um, of those, maybe two-thirds or so are low income, um, uh, living in subsidized housing and so forth. We've made about 5,000 uh, patient visits. Some of those visits have been for treatment of simple uh, infections and so forth. Some of them have been so sick when we've gotten there, we've realized that the appropriate care is medical hospice, and we've been able to arrange that uh, for the patient much more quickly. Uh, oftentimes, what they just needed was somebody to come and reassure them. They just needed you know, somebody at a time of anxiety to, to come to their home, and a nurse or a nurse practitioner was able to do that with a minimum of medical intervention. Uh, many of you probably know that our grant funding actually ran out this past July. We were trying to figure out, are we going to be able to survive without uh, Uncle Sam's grant? Uh, we had a lot of meetings with people, all different types of people, and some of them were, were with the patients that we've taken care of with DASH. And we were really moved to hear again and again them saying to us, please don't let this program die. Uh, this is really something that has made a major difference to us. Uh, I think our nurses in particular have become a lifeline to a great number of people. And to that end, I'm happy to say it doesn't look like it's going to. Uh, we've been working on forming partnerships, both for kind of contracted type of payments, but also for philanthropic support. And all of that seems to be coming along well. So I anticipate that this program is going to be able to go on long into the future. Uh, it's interesting. I mentioned the three goals of the grant program, which was the easy triad of improved quality, improved satisfaction, and lowered costs. We just this last week got back the final report from the outside evaluators and found out that DASH was one of really a very small handful of the 106 programs that managed to do all three of those things. So we're very proud and we think that this is probably going to become a type of healthcare that's going to be able to be widely delivered into the future. Anyway, in closing, I'm really pleased to receive this award. Uh, I'm, we're receiving it on behalf of all of the people who built the, built the program, the nurses, the administrators, the other physicians. Uh, also, probably more than anybody else, to the patients and to the families that put their trust in us, uh, that put their trust in an untested model of care that nobody had ever seen before, and they invited us into their lives, invited us into their homes. 
Uh, it is our real desire that that trust was not misplaced and that we'll continue to live up to it. Thank you very much for the award and thank you for all your support. Thank you. And um, now it is my pleasure to introduce our next recipient of our Heroes of Hospice Award. And uh, our Heroes of Hospice Legacy Award goes to a beautiful woman, long time and very important history with Hospice of Santa Barbara. She worked for Hospice for more than 15 years, but her family's ties to the organization date back to when her father, Malcolm Petey, was actually the hospice board of directors president in the early 80s, introduced her to the organization and told her about an open position, wouldn't you know? She's had two major roles at Hospice of Santa Barbara. She served as RN case manager and then later as director of volunteers. As hospice RN case manager, she supported terminally ill patients and their families and learned about the important role the families play in the patient support system. Cherished, she was. And uh, she worked at Hospice of Santa Barbara until 1989, and then couldn't stay away. She returned in 2001 as the director of volunteers, where she played a vital role in establishing the volunteer program. She's used her experience as a nurse to train hundreds of volunteers over the years. And today, Hospice of Santa Bar Barbara Volunteer Program has more than 100 volunteers and critical, it is a critical component to what they do, due in large part to this woman. In addition, she and her husband also have made a very generous bequest to Hospice of Santa Barbara as part of the Legacy Club. Please help me in welcoming to the stage Dana Vandermeer. Hello. Catherine, thank you, because you gave a lot of my speech, so I can just be very brief. <laughs> I was very nervous, and as Catherine said, um, yeah, I've been hanging around hospice since 1980, when my dad first invited me to go as his guest to a fashion show that the auxiliary was putting on, and quite frankly, I didn't know very much about hospice. I was working critical care, saving lives, stamping out disease, and a lot of people thought I would have a difficult time uh, going to hospice, but the transition was great. I loved it. Thank you, Charlie Zimmer and Barbara Brown Rose for believing in me. <laughs> for they hired me without any hospice or home care experience, and they took a chance on me. I also, uh, during my time at hospice, um, became a recipient because my dad died rather suddenly in 1985, and so we received, in fact, the nurse that was with my dad is here today. She's a good friend. Yeah, Catherine Bucky. Thank you, Catherine. We became friends instantly because we shared that love for my dad. So hanging around hospice, it became part of my DNA. I was a recipient of the services. My family got to experience that. We got counseling for over a year at no cost to our family. That's one of the amazing things about HSB. And HSB stayed part of my DNA. During my 12-year absence, uh, I still attended a lot of the fundraising events, light up a life. In fact, uh, took my children. I have my son here today. My uh, daughter was interviewed by KEYT at one of the light up a lives, and they said, why do you come? She said, I've been coming since I was five years old. She said, Light of a Life is part of our family tradition in December. We would never miss it. And now she brings her children. I love HSB. As it was mentioned, um, my husband and I have made provision for it in our charitable remainder trust because we believe so much what HSB does. And again, when I came back in 2001, uh, Gail Rink hired me along with Joanne Tablet. Thank you, Joanne Tablet, for being here. We started over, and we started the, Joanne started the counseling services, I started the volunteer services, and together we worked on the patient care, and it's um, 
growing and it's wonderful and I, I feel very blessed and privileged to be part of it. When I retired three years ago, I was given this badge that says ambassador at large. <laughs> I wear it proudly and I'll have you know I carry donation envelopes in my purse. <laughs> and I've had people stop me at the bowling alley and ask me about hospice and I say, I have a donation envelope right here. You can make your donation, and they've done that. So I'm very proud to be an ambassador for HSB. And I feel that this award today is not just for me. I stand on the shoulders of many people. But Gail Rink and my dad, this is for you. So thank you, and thank you, HSB. And now I'd like to welcome to stage to do our volunteer announcements. Our, the Actually, she is the Director of Volunteer Services for Hospice of Santa Barbara. Would Nicole Ramasanta please come on up and do our next set of announcing. Thank you. I'm glad that I'm after Dana and not Dr. Troutwine. <laughs> so, so I have the honor of presenting the Volunteer Heroes of Hospice Awards. This year we're honoring three very special volunteers, Muriel Ross, Joe Joel, and Ann Smith Kors. Each of these volunteers has volunteered for Hospice of Santa Barbara for over 30 years. But more impressive than the quantity of time that they have volunteered is the quality of compassionate care that they have consistently provided over those years. Each of them truly embodies the mission of Hospice of Santa Barbara providing compassionate care to those with serious illness or grieving the loss of a loved one. Every Hospice of Santa Barbara volunteer has a story, their reason for wanting to volunteer in this way. They choose to walk into the hardest chapter of a family's life. They're people with kind and generous hearts who donate their time, energy, and care to enhancing the quality of life of others. I feel incredibly fortunate to get to work with them every day. They're an amazing group of people. Now I'd like to share a little bit about our honorees, their stories, what brought them to Hospice of Santa Barbara as volunteers, and some of the impact they've had on the people that they've served. I'd like to start with Muriel Ross. Muriel grew up in Montreal, Canada, and later was a nurse in training in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It was during her training that she recognized the need for terminally ill patients to receive compassionate care and to not be left alone. Unfortunately, compassionate care was not being practiced at the time, and instead, she witnessed a rigorous, unsympathetic care that did not have regard for the patient's wants and needs. Muriel continued her education, she became a registered nurse, and for several years, she worked as head nurse for a psychiatric hospital. She later moved to the United States with her family, and when her children were off to college, Muriel decided it was time to become a hospice volunteer and provide compassionate care to those with serious illness. So many of our patients and families have had the privilege of having Muriel Ross as their patient care volunteer, where she provides love, care, compassion, and respect. There's no doubt that the compassionate care that she found lacking when she was a nurse in training all of those years ago, she has provided a hundredfold to the people that we serve. We are also honoring Joe Joel today. Joe began volunteering for Hospice of Santa Barbara sometime after, his losing, after losing his wife to cancer at the age of 37. He felt a strong connection to the people that come to Hospice of Santa Barbara for help because of the painful loss that he himself had experienced. One of the reasons that he says he enjoys volunteering for Hospice of Santa Barbara is that even though we cannot cure the people we serve, we can provide social, emotional, practical, and spiritual care that helps to ease their journeys. Joe is a Hawaiian native who brings his heart and the sweetness of his aloha spirit to everyone he meets. He approaches not only the patients he's served, but also staff and his fellow volunteers with a presence that is truly kind and always genuine. It's just who Joe is. 
Joe has served as a patient care volunteer, as well as a No One Dies Alone volunteer, a spiritual companion, a support group co-facilitator for men's grief, and for the survivors of suicide group, just to name a few of his roles. And in all of those roles, he has brought comfort to the people that he has served. Ann Smith Kors is the third volunteer that we are honoring today, and she does a lot of traveling. So she's not here today, she's actually abroad, but when she returns in a couple of weeks, I will personally present her with her award. Anne came to volunteer at Hospice of Santa Barbara after a lengthy career as a nurse and a midwife in three different countries. Again, she does a lot of traveling. She saw firsthand the good work that volunteers do throughout her career, so she decided that after she retired, it was time for her to start her volunteer career. Anne feels that it is a privilege to be a volunteer and to give back in this way, and she expresses her gratitude to the many patients and families who by their gifts have enriched her life. Anne served as a patient care volunteer, a bereavement volunteer, and a no one dies alone volunteer, again, just to name a few. And it's through the many hours of listening to her patient stories, being present to the myriad of emotions that one expresses when grieving, and just being there without judgment or an agenda that make Ann Smith Corps such a valuable volunteer to Hospice of Santa Barbara. There's a quote. I judge myself not by what I have, but by what I'm willing to give. And all three of these volunteer honorees have given so beautifully to Hospice of Santa Barbara throughout the years. So I'd like to ask Muriel and Joe to please come up to the stage to receive their awards, and let's all give them a big round of applause. Congratulations to all of our winners. Actually, congratulations to everybody that's here today. I feel like I'm back on the radio. But um, you were part of something really spectacular today, so go out, as we say, and I like uh, Dana said it too, be ambassadors of this great organization. Thank you for your support, and thank you for coming out to the luncheon, and we'll see you all very soon. One more thing. We'd like to thank Catherine Remock so much for doing this, supporting our event. This is for you. We have a gift certificate for you too. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you everyone for being here. This is lovely, thank you. <laughs>